Hello to everybody. Welcome to another edition of our Monday night Mishle class. Tonight's shiur is sponsored by Mr. and Mrs. Eve Nachmias in memory of Esther Nachmias Yichonali Bracha. May the words of Torah that we say tonight, the lessons that we learn, the wisdom that we attain, be leilud nishmata ti nafshat rurabi tzora chayim. Amen. Now, the other day I was having a important discussion with one of my children. And it was something that I felt I had to talk privately with him, with my son, about something important. And you start off a conversation when there's something meaningful. You go, son, I want to tell you something. This is what I want to say, and I feel it's really important. You give that little introduction. Yet again, here we see tonight in Mishle, Shlomo HaMelech relaying such potent messages for us and he always refers to us as son, as Beni, my son. You wouldn't do that if you didn't care. You wouldn't, if you, were, if you just wanted to say something to a random guy in the street, you wouldn't pull him aside and you wouldn't say uh, something, you know. My son, this is something that I really, really feel strongly about. We are studying Sefer Mishle, the seventh chapter. We are in the middle of a very long discussion over the course of the last seven chapters on how to attain wisdom in the proper uh, methods of doing so, and in, included in that means avoiding the Yetzirah, learning Torah, so on and so th- forth, performing the mitzvot that we've expanded on so much in the previous six chapters. Uh, yet again tonight, he begins again with the chap- with the word Beni, my son, the beginning of the seventh chapter, Perak Zayin, Pasuk Aleph, if you're following inside at home or if you're listening on the web, wherever you are. Shlomo HaMelech, again, this personal approach to the listener, to the reader, to the learner. And he says, Beni Shemor Amarai, my son, please hear my words. Hear my words constantly, just like a father would tell his son. I need you to pay attention to what I am saying. Specifically, the words Amarai here can mean the words of Torah study. These are the words, whenever we see words, it's words of Torah. Because words of Torah are obligatory at all times. Shlomo HaMelech says the Vilna Gaon is warning his son to constantly review everything that he learns in order that you will not forget them. We Jews have the obligation to engage in Torah study all the time, day in and day, night, and day, in and day out, and morning and at night time. Some people are early risers. Some people like to stay up late. There is ways for everyone to reach the beauty of the Torah. Some people enjoy it more in the morning. I, for one, am a morning type of person. I wake up early. That's when I do my morning learning. Uh, at night, I'm devoted to the shiurim. And some people, no, they, they, you know, it's tough for them to get out of bed. But at night, they can stay up late. By all means, that is the time. Words are the ethical teachings, the philosophical insights of the Torah, which a person needs to internalize and recognize as truth. And the treasure, my commandments, and treasure my commandments with yourself. We have already learned that many commandments are only performed at certain times. Right? If I was to open Megillat Esther right now and read it in front of you and you're listening, you're not fulfilling the mitzvah of Kiryat Megillah because it's not Purim right now. If I was to light the Chanukah candles tonight, you wouldn't fulfill the mitzvah of Nerot Chanukah because Chanukah is in four days. It's not tonight. So treasure the mitzvot with yourself. Be ready to perform them whenever the appropriate time is. When that time arrives, jump at the opportunity to perform the mitzvah. Shemor mitzvotai bechyeh. Heed my commandments and live. Because of them, you will live. You will attain an eternal life. The Torah tells us, Ki hu yamecha. The Torah is your life and your long days. Rabbeinu Bechaye divides the commandments into three categories. There is something, one category is called mitzvot mekubalot, which are the received commandments. These commandments had to be received from God because a person can never deduce them from their own understanding. 
Among these mitzvot that we have include tefillin, tzitzit, brit milah, sukkah, shofar, shabbat, yovel, 50 years, jubilee. The Torah refers to these mitzvot as edut, testimonies, because they testify to God's divinity and His creation of the world. The second category of mitzvot would be mitzvot muskalot, which are logical commandments. These are the commandments that mankind would have been able to deduce uh, even had the Torah not been given. For example, uh, robbery, or theft, murder, deceit. The Torah refers to these as mishpatim, civil laws, ordinances. Uh, they're, they're the laws that make it possible for society to run smoothly, to function without lowering itself to violence and strife. Last but not least is mitzvot she'en taman niglan umvoar, commandments which the reason of it is not revealed or clarified. For example, forbidden mixtures, the prohibition against cooking meat and milk, uh, the, the, the goat being thrown down the mountain on Yom Kippur, the paraduma, uh, the red cow. These are referred to as hokim. The first two pesukim in this chapter that we started reading refer to these three categories. Heed my words refers to the received commandments. The mekubalot, the tefillin, the tzitzit. God is saying, you got to listen. Listen to what I'm telling you, otherwise you wouldn't know. And live refers to the logical commandments, because that's how you live life. You live life not murdering people. You live life not robbing somebody else. You live life being truthful, not being deceitful. Then treasure my commandments, tzitzpon, refers to the commandments whose reasons are hidden. That's why the shortest of the word titzpon is tzafun. Tzafun, we have on Pesach, is one of the 15 steps of the seder. Tzafun is we hide the afikoman. Things that, the, the reason for the mitzvot are hidden are not known to us. And therefore, we still perform them anyways. Betorati keishon enecha. Listen to my Torah like the apple of your eyes. What is the meaning of ishon? Some say it's the blackness of the eye. The Metzudot explains the term to mean ishon lashon ish, a man. When a person looks a man in the eye, he is reflected in the pupil of the eye. And therefore, just like man zealously protects his eyes just so that he should not become blind, so too he should heed to the Torah, the intellectual eye, which provides him with illumination. Think about the eye for the moment. It is probably the part of the body that people care the most about. We, ask, we say, thank you so much for giving me the eyesight. What a person would do if he didn't have the eyesight. It's very difficult. And the only thing that's really protecting this eye is our eyelid. That's the only thing. We close our eyes and that's this little flimsy piece of skin. If you touch it, you realize how flimsy it is. This is the only thing that protects our eye. Yes, it's in a socket. It's embedded in a socket. But you would think that maybe HaKadosh Baruch Hu would put something stronger there. The fact is, the eyelid, when squeezed very tight, becomes rock solid. It's an unbelievable mechanism that HaKadosh Baruch Hu created in the body. You close your eyes as tight as you can, nothing goes in. Nothing's penetrated. So therefore, the same idea. They're just like a person protects his eyes no matter what. He closes his eyes. No ma- he has to really accept the Torah from it as well. The, the, that's why the Sanhedrin, who were the teachers of the Jewish people, they were called the eyes of the congregation. So when the eyes are open, it has to be for the purpose of illuminating spirituality, making it visible to everybody. And when God forbid something is the opposite, when God forbid there's tumah in the world, and there's disgust in the world, then you got to close your eyes as hard as you can till, you're, till it's impenetrable. The Midrash tells us that David HaMelech requested of Hashem in Tehilim, Shomreni ke ishon bat ayin. Guard me like the pupil of the eye. To which God commanded, uh, uh, and he replied to him, Shemor mitzvotai v'chaye. Listen to my commandment and live. Same as from our pasuk. If a person listens to the mitzvot and performs the mitzvot, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will protect him. A case in point is the Kriyat Shema that we recite at least twice a day. The prayer contains a total of 248 words. And that 
corresponds to the 248 organs and limbs in a person's body. Hashem promises that if a person recites Shema properly and fulfills what's written in the prayer, He will protect the person's limbs and organs, all 248 of them. So what do you do? Kosrem al etzbeotecha. Bind them on your fingers. In the simple lashon, make reminders to yourself in a visible place so that you should always remember the mitzvot. Nowadays we live in a world where notif- the word notification has taken upon itself a meaning of its own. Notifications. Notifications everywhere you go. You have them on your phone. You have them on your computer in front of you. You have them in your car. You, you don't even have to see the notifications. You could feel the notifications. You have them on your watch. This idea of notifications makes really anything you want to do inexcusable. Because once you set it up, it's there. The reminders are there. You have reminders for your medication. You have rem- reminders for your, for, your, for your pills. You have reminders for your meetings. Notifications is everywhere. So if that's the case, why can't we make notifications for our mitzvot? Why can't we make reminders and tie something? says, Bind them on your fingers so that you remember what to do. After the Torah, after Shlomo Melch is telling us to heed the Torah and the mitzvot, here we're addressing an individual who is so preoccupied with work that he seems to have little time to remember or engage in any form of study. And he's going to give the excuse, I'm tired, look how hard I work, and maybe I, I, because of my work I don't have time to perform these mitzvot. And therefore, koshrem al etzbeotecha, bind them on your fingers, in every step of your work, whatever you do in life, try to find a connection to the mitzvah. When you work your field in the olden days, make sure you pull with two oxen or two donkeys, but not one of each because that's not allowed. Torah forbids one to harness together two different species of animals. When you plant, have the kavana, have the intent to avoid planting kilayim, the forbidden mixtures, such as planting grain and vegetables together. You can't do that. When you reap, have in mind to keep aside the required amount for the poor, the leket, the gleanings, the shicha, the, that's for the forgotten sheaves, and the peah, the edge of the field. In doing business, make sure you have in mind that you're going to put aside your tzedakah, your 10%, and you're not going to act with fraud. You're going to deal honestly in business. In that way, every action that you do, you are kosrem al You are taking a string and you're tying it on your finger, and wherever you go, you look at your finger and you say, and that's your reminder of how I have to deal, how I have to act. The Shem Shamaim, the name of God. Our Chachamim compare the ten forms of labor needed to produce bread to a person's ten fingers and the ten commandments that one fulfills while in the process of baking. This is one of the reasons why we have to hold ten f- the bread with ten fingers. When we say Hamotzi Lechem in Aretz, according to Kabbalah, we should be holding the bread with ten fingers because there are ten steps involved. But there's also ten mitzvot connected to that. So deep. Kotvem aluach libecha, Shlomo HaMelech says. Inscribe them on the tablet of your heart because your fingers, your hands, which we said you're going to tie something with, on, it signifies your action, but the heart signifies your thought. Make the words of Torah indelible in your consciousness. Make it a part of you so that, they, so that it controls your emotions, your desires, and your actions. Emor la chokma achoti hi, achoti at, umoda la binatikra. You tell wisdom, you are my sister. That's how you should refer to your wisdom. And call understanding a kinsman. Be as familiar with wisdom as a person is with his sister. The one of the 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 Hasidic rebbe's of Mordechai Alter of Avram Mordechai Alter of Gur, he takes this pasuk and he 
interprets it homiletically. And he says, everyone is so close with their sister. Everyone loves their sister. But we all know that any form of intimacy is forbidden with one sister, according to the Torah, obviously, and it's just known around the world. Therefore, the same thing here. Although a person needs to cultivate his own intelligence and judgment, he should beware of too much reliance on his mental prowess. The wisdom of the Torah is what's important. The wisdom of the Torah always supersedes your own wisdom. And whenever in doubt, and whenever thinking, ah, but I think one way, but the Torah is telling me another way, you got to choose the way of the Torah. A person should sacrifice himself for Torah just like people are willing to sacrifice their lives for their own sibling, their own sister. We see this last week's perasha, the actions of Shimon and Levi, Yaakov's sons, on behalf of their sister Dina. They saw something that they didn't like, how Dina went out and she was taken by Shechem and she was violated. Look how they defended their sister. Just like you would do that, you defend the Torah. Just like you defend one of your siblings, you defend the Torah and the mitzvot. If someone comes to you to speak ill of the Torah, to speak ill of the mitzvot, to put down religion, spirituality, you defend it. Just like you would defend your sibling. Rav Hirsch explains that we, we are to call wisdom our sister. Why? Because our sister is our father's daughter. Not our biological father but rather HaKadosh Baruch Hu and Shamayim. Just like we are indebted to God for our physical existence, we are also indebted to Him for the wisdom that He placed at our side, like our sister, like Miriam Haneviyah, who watched over Moshe Rabenu when he was just an infant and arranged for his own mother to nurse him. With wisdom as our sister, we can stride towards true truth, divine truth, and be protected from mistakes that may, God forbid, separate us from God. Umoda la binatikra, and call understanding a kinsman. Kinsman refers to like a niece or a nephew. And understanding is compared to the relative, because it's born from your sister. It's born from wisdom. First there's chokhmah, and then there's bina. Bina comes, the understanding comes from the chokhmah. Lishmorcha me'isha zaram. Because this wisdom and understanding, this sister and kinsman, will safeguard you from the forbidden woman. Again, mentioning the forbidden woman, which we spoke about in length last week, and again, we're going to do it today. From a foreign woman whose words are glib. Here we have a forbidden woman and a foreign woman. For those joining us for the first time, normally the when Shlomo Amel talks about this forbidden woman, or Isha Zara, it's in reference to heresy or form of idol worship. That's the metaphorical way of understanding this, but it can also be understood literally. But most commentators say it is the uh, allegorical term. So the forbidden woman refers to the Jewish woman other than one's, li- one's wife, and the foreign woman refers to the non-Jewish woman. So the Vilna Gaon says the forbidden woman refers to the sin of Hamda. Chemda is to covet or not to covet. Because coveting something is wanting something that is forbidden to you. That's not yours. When I, God gave your neighbor this beautiful car and it belongs to your neighbor, it's not yours. And if you covet something that's, that's, that's not yours, God forbid you may take it and therefore there's a love involved. There's a, there's a sin involved because it was never yours. It's forbidden for you to take. Versus the foreign woman, says the Vilna Gaon, is re- re- in reference to ta'ava, lust. Lust for permitted things. I have this lust to, to, uh, to, to do something that, that I'm allowed to, but I shouldn't be doing because I need to maintain a, a high level of spirituality. That's the foreign woman. Ki bechalon beti be'ad eshnabi nishkafti. For I looked out of my window from my house through my lattice. So just as an introduction again, in the following Pesukim, Shlomo HaMelech is going to describe how a harlot entices men with glib talk. And in order to impress the listener with seriousness and truthfulness of the warning, 
Shlomo HaMelech is describing the occurrence as if he saw it himself from his window. Now, this is a very long discussion that I'm afraid we're not going to finish tonight. We're not done yet, but we're not going to finish all of it tonight about this this foreign woman um, or this harlot. But keep in mind that, again, the allegorical meaning to it about heresy and Abu Dazara. So Shlomo HaMelech is saying here, metaphorically, thanks to my wisdom, because I saw it, because I was able to attain wisdom, I understood people's actions. I know what's going to happen now when being enticed by this woman. A window implies seeing something that is openly visible. A lattice implies uh, an aperture through which hidden things may be glimpsed, maybe not. I saw among the simpletons. I discerned among the youths a lad, a young boy who lacked understanding of a heart. He, threw, he looked through the window and he saw groups of gullible people, Shlomo. And among them, there was this young lad lacking understanding, meaning lacking the ability to control his desires. What was he doing? Over Basuk Etzel Pina. He was passing through the marketplace near her corner. Her corner, again, the harlot. Her corner, the corner of the harlots and the idolaters. Vederech Beita Yitzad. And he strode toward her house. The pasuk specifies the shuk, the marketplace, because the yetzer ara does not control a person unless he makes the first move and exposes himself to temptation. The power of the yetzer ara is progressive. The rabbis tell us in Masechet Sukkah, first it's compared to a traveler, someone who just passes by, a helech. Then it becomes a guest, someone you're a little bit more familiar with. And then finally it becomes ish, a master. So this, this sequence in the Pasuk is suggested here. Passing through the marketplace is the initial step of sin. When the Yetzara influences a person's thoughts, casually. So that's how sin begins, slowly but surely. Initially, the sinner is like someone passing through the marketplace. But once a person begins to leave the Torah, it distances itself from him. The Torah distances itself from him. And gradually, he removes himself so far from the Torah that he goes near her corner. All of a sudden, he becomes the Yetzirah's guest. He's now a little bit more welcome. Finally, he walked towards her house. He became so accustomed to going there that she leads him and it becomes her house. She is now the mistress, the master of the house. In the twilight as day- daylight wanes in the blackness of night and darkness. The, this lad walks in the darkness so that people won't see him. He thinks people won't see him. The word neshef can refer to dark- darkness at the beginning of the evening or the darkness before the pre-dawn hours. In fact, there are four terms in this pasuk in reference to darkness. You have neshef, which is like the twilight. It's not yet night, but it's dark. Be'erev in the evening is when the stars begin to appear. Be'ishon Laila is the blackness of the night, which is the middle of the night, when people can be seen with only great difficulty. And last is pitch darkness. That's called Afela. That's at the pre-dawn hours when darkness is, is absolute. In a figurative sense, <clears throat> uh, the rabbis explain that the night refers to this world and the Torah is the light that illuminates this world. The Torah can also be studied on four levels, and therefore there's four levels of illumination. Peshat, which is the literal meaning of the words. Remez, which is the implied meaning of the words. Drash, which is the expounded meaning. And Sod, the secret hidden meaning. If someone forsakes the study of Torah, first he's going to forget the Sodot, which is the highest level, the secrets. Then the Drash, which is level three, interpretations of difficult passages. Then the Remazim, the hints, and it comes to a time where he'll even, God forbid, forget the pshat, even the simple, literal meaning of the Torah, he'll be left in total darkness in Afelah. It is said that Rabbi Elazar ben Arach, who was one of the greatest disciples of Rabbi Yohanan ben Zakkai, and Rabbi Yohanan ben Zakkai referred to him as a spring 
flowing stronger and stronger. Kemayan Amit Kaber in Perke in Perke Avot he's referred to. His mystical interpretation of the Torah was so great, Rabbi Elazar ben Arach, was so brilliant, that Rabbi Yohanan ben Zakai once said about him, Fortunate are you, Abraham Arvinu, that from your descendants came Elazar ben Arach. Wow, what a statement. Unfortunately, after Rabbi Yohanan ben Zakai died, most of his disciples remained in Yavne. But Rabbi Elazar ben Arach chose not to. He went to move to the city where his wife grew up. A lovely, beautiful, healthful place. The problem was, he was long isolated from his colleagues, and that caused his Torah to deteriorate. And according to the Gemaran Masechet Shabbat, Rabbi Lazar ben Arach was attracted to the waters of the city, meaning the lifestyle of its people, and consequently, his learning vanished. And one day, he returned back to Yavne where he was honored with an Aliyah la Torah. In those days, whoever got an Aliyah to the Torah not only just said the Brachot, but they also read the Torah. Uh, he read the Torah portion. And he was reading Parashat Bo, and the passage of Rosh Chodesh. And instead of reading the Pasuk, HaChodesh Hazeh Lachem Rosh Chodashim, this month shall be unto you, he read mistakenly, Hacheresh haya libam. Hachodesh hazelachem. He read, Hacheresh haya libam. Their heart was silent. To such a degree he forgot his learning. He couldn't even read the most obvious pasuk properly. The Chachamim of Yavne, the sages, saw this. They couldn't believe it. They prayed for him and his great knowledge was restored. So this is what happens. We need the Torah to illuminate our darkness. And this was going on with this guy, this young lad. He's walking in the marketplace. He thinks nobody can see him, but he's, he's, he's alone in the dark. And behold, a woman approached him. According to Rashi, it means actually a woman, or again, figuratively, to a person who wants to entice him to sin. The nakedness of a harlot. Unsurat lev. And with siege in her heart, her heart is surrounded, engulfed, by foolishness and lewdness, this woman besieges the hearts of men to control them and to capture them. Homiyahi, she's tumultuous. She makes an uproar so that everyone around her should hear her voice in the darkness. She wants to see the commotion. She wants to see the tumult in the world. And therefore, she goes out. Vesoraret, and she's rebellious. She abandons the ways of the righteous. She speaks words of rebellion and adultery. Her feet do not dwell at home. By not remaining in her home, she violates all the laws of modesty. We are taught in Sefer Teilim, Kol Kevuda Bat Melech Penima. Every honorable princess dwells within. And again, I relate you back to the parasha we read this past week, that horrific incident with Dina and how she was violated by Shechem. How did Shechem even find her? This is the daughter of Yaakov Avinu. And Rashi says, you want to know how she, how she was found? Just look at the first word in the, parash, in the parasha. Vatetze Dina bat lea. Dina went out. She went out of where? She went out of her house. Rashi says, Yaitzanit haita. It was, she was a girl that liked to explore. She liked to go out. She liked to mingle with people and see. Although there's nothing wrong with mingling with people, but for a person who wants to be repre- who wants to represent the Bat Melech, the princess, to be a princess of God, it's best to be within. It's best to be at home as much as possible. This was the, the brilliance. This is what made our, our matriarch so great. That of Sarai Menu, Sarai Ba'oel. When the Malachim came to Abraham Avinu and said, Where's your wife? And Abraham Avinu said, she's in the tent. It's where she is. She's modest. She's inside. She's humble. Dina made the mistake of going out and to explore, revealing herself in social ways, in social circles. And that's how she was grabbed by, by the son of Hamor, Shechem ben Hamor. 
Pam bachutz, pam barchavot, sometimes in the courtyard, sometimes in the squares, to chase after her lovers. Va'etzel kol pinate erov. She looks, she lurks at every corner, waiting to find someone lacking understanding. She's trying to find bait. She's the bait. See who she's gonna what, what's a catch? Who's the hunt? She sees him, kissed him, thrust forth her face and said to him, brazenly, with no shame, only that after she saw that the initial advances were not repulsed and the guy, the young boy was willing to listen and to be with her, now she jumps on the opportunity and she says, the following words, this is the approach of the Yetzirah. First it shows love to the person, only then does it speak up. What does the Yetzirah say? What does this evil woman say? Whoa. I had vowed to bring peace offerings, and today I fulfilled my vow. What is going on here? Mm-hmm. Says the Eben Ezra, this woman is speaking deceitfully. She's concealing her evil intent by implying that she offers sacrifices of religious nature, shelamim, like a korban shelamim, a korban of thanks, the Yetzirah could could not just grab a person by approaching him directly and say, uh, let's do a sin. doesn't work that like that. First, it presents a person with an opportunity to perform a mitzvah and thereby withdraws him towards sin, from the mitzvah towards sin. And that's, Using this, using this ploy, this evil woman serves meat from these peace offerings, these shelamim, because such offerings are not brought to atone for sins. It's a great mitzvah to eat from the korban shelamim. Not only that, it's a mitzvah to eat such meat so that it won't be any left over, because any meat that's left over from a korban shelamim is considered notar, extra, and must be burned. And therefore, having eaten and rejoiced, this, not, this person can now feel happy, he feels rejoiced, but yet he's also vulnerable to the Yetzirah because the Yetzirah can best succeed if it sweetens its victims with good deeds and then sometimes even gets them to perform total evil. A person needs to be wary of sinning at all times, especially when feasting and rejoicing in the mitzvah for that's a perfect breeding ground for the Satan this is the reason why our Ashkenazi brothers have a custom to fast on Monday, Thursday, and Monday. Three days that follow the holidays of Pesach and Sukkot. Because since these holidays are extended per- periods of eating and drinking and rejoicing, one fears that the joy may have led to kalut rosh, to lightheadedness, which require repentance and atonement. And therefore, many Ashkenazi Jews, many Hasidic Jews, and many Yirei Shamaim have the custom to fast for three days after these, after these Chagim. Alken yatsati likratecha leshacher panecha vaemsaeka. That is why I went out toward you to seek your countenance, and I found you. I have a mitzvah to share. The Yetzirah says. And I know you love mitzvot very much. So I want I found you to enable you to do the good deed. And I, and, and HaKadosh Baruch Hu helped me and I found you right away. Marvadim ravati arshi. I have decked my bed with spreads. Again, she continues her enticement telling this victim that, she's, that she is prepared in, in anticipation of his visit. Hatuvot etun mitzrayim. My bed is aligned with superior Egyptian linen. Her description of even her bedspreads, the highly praised Egyptian linen or cotton. The Vilna Gaon explains this metaphorically, that this world is alluded to as night, like we said. The pleasures that we have in this world are in reference to the bed. Beds are comfortable. There's not There's enjoyment when we lie down. And the Yetzirah says, Why should you pass up all the delights in this world, which are as pleasant as the bed, bedecked with love, with lovely spreads? And that's what Mitzrayim symbolizes. Mitzrayim, Egypt, symbolizes the earthly pleasures. 
because that is the source of lust and the breeding ground for impurities. And she says, Nafti mishkavi mor ahalim bekinamon. I have not only spread my bed with his beautiful linen, but I have perfumed my bread with aloes and cinnamon, like a person who waves a scarf in a perfume store in order to circulate the scent. I have sprinkled my bed with aromatic spices of aloes and cinnamon to bring a good scent to you so that you can come with me. This is all part of her plan. And as we're going to learn next week, Bezat Hashem, she assures him that he has nothing to fear. And he's going to have to come up with a plan as he rushes to his doom, as he's on his way down, he's spiraling down. What's he going to do to get out of this? Bezat Hashem, we will continue this evil scheme of the forbidden woman next week. Have a wonderful evening, everybody. Good night. The Finding Holiness podcast has been brought to you by Eli's Fine Foods. Check out their website at elisfinefoods.com, serving the Toronto community for over 25 years.